Hey, it's your old pal Lucid Stew again, and we are going to talk about how you can make your own functioning racing game scene with high score and AI driver opponents with Ninjuana's Super GP kit in Dreams for PS4 and PS5, so let's get to it. There are two basic ways to get you started with this kit, and they can both be found by searching for Super GP kit in Dream Shaping. The first is Super GP Track Kit. This is an element that contains all of the Super GP Kit pieces aligned to grid, including the scenery pieces. So you might want to come back to this once you're ready to build. But for now, we will proceed with the Super GP Construction Kit. This is a collection that holds all of the kit pieces found in the Super GP Track Kit. I'm going with this because I want to ignore scenery and give you the tips and tricks you need to get a functioning track and game scene running as quickly and easily as possible. The very first piece you want to set down is the Super GP starting grid and game logic element. I recommend placing this with a two grid on and with the middle of the starting line at the origin. This will help you stay lined up when placing other pieces. It's a little difficult to get it right at the origin, so just try to get it close and then adjust it. This is the most important piece in the scene because it contains the game logic, the driver's logic and car, and all of the AI opponent cars and their logic. That also makes it pretty expensive from a game playing graphics thermal standpoint, but don't worry, the kit leaves plenty of room for decorating. The nice thing about this kit is that you don't need to know precisely how it works in order to use it, but I'm going to show you some things about this piece that will help you adjust and customize the scene to your liking. If we turn preview and visibility off, we see there's a bit more here than meets the eye, and the first part is the track minimap. This is a cool feature that creates a map in your UI so you can see where the driver and AI cars are relative to it. We'll cover that more extensively later in the video. Next up is the red cube on top of the track bumper. If you scope into this, you will find the game logic. The game logic is quite extensive. I will not cover it in depth, but there are a few things in here you can easily adjust if you like. You have some global options like sun and sky, audio mixer, global settings, and grade and effect gadgets. This selector acts as a game state machine. One output that may be important to you is C, which represents the race running. You can use that to power up music, for instance. You can also just take a music clip, drop it into the scene, set it to power on and loop, and that works fine if messing with the selector seems like too much work. There is a microchip called variables that contains all sorts of things, but one in particular of interest is the lap goal which determines how many laps your race it is, and you can change that. So if you have a particularly short circuit, maybe you want to make it five laps instead of the default of three. Some other logic that you can tweak and experiment on without wrecking the entire game is contained in the race vehicles. These each have a microchip for the vehicle itself called Deluxe Chassis Logic, and then another one called Controller, which handles player or AI input for control of the vehicle. Of interest in there is the AI microchip. This contains some sliders that allow you to individually adjust the difficulty for the AI drivers. You also have the AI throttle control microchip in there and that contains some gadgets you can adjust to affect the variability and effectiveness of the AI rubber banding. If you're not familiar, this is a gameplay technique wherein the AI slow down or speed up in order to induce a race state where the player is in constant competition with the AIs. It basically prevents blowouts in either direction. In my opinion, it's a little overactive by default, so you may want to adjust that, and you can do so with the signal gen and a couple of calculators in there. One other thing in the starter grid piece you will surely want to change is the banner with the track name at the start line. You can easily find the starting line logic microchip by turning x-ray vision on. There are five text displayer gadgets, four are flags, the center one is the track name text. If your track name is particularly long, one simple solution is to clone the banner to give you some extra space. 
that does it for the starter grid. Let's move on to building the track. If you bring track pieces into the scene and position them with a two grid, this works pretty well, but you'll likely need to adjust them with precise move once you have them fairly closely aligned. A good guide for alignment is the paint stripes on either side of the roadway. They should be pretty well aligned in all three directions with the strips just barely touching. It should be close but doesn't need to be perfect. We'll touch on why that's the case in just a second. Proper orientation matters and it matters a lot because the wrong orientation can break your racing game. With x-ray vision you'll notice each track piece contains one or more lap distance microchips. These serve several functions, but in order to do so, the logic on a track piece must be set up to recognize the logic in the track piece before it. The wireless receiver named lap section 1 through 8 will have a reception zone, and that zone must envelop the last lap distance microchip of the previous track section. If it does not, when you hit that section during a race, you'll get a wrong way message, and the AI cars will get stuck. I wouldn't worry about adjusting these until you have your circuit completed, but assemble your track with x-ray vision on so you can recognize when you have track pieces oriented improperly. In the kit you will notice there are explicitly left and right turn pieces. Getting those correct matters because of the necessity of the track section microchips lining up. Bring in each new piece on a two grid and then adjust with precise move. After you align the first one of a type, you can copy that one on a two grid and it will align a little easier if you need another. In addition to straights and curves, this kit includes elevation changes, so let's talk about that. One piece included is a bridge which enables you to run your track under or over itself. If you place this bridge even with the track you're wishing to go under or over, you find your path blocked. That is because the bridge piece only elevates the underside of its deck to the upper side of a regular track piece at the same level. You need to raise it further to allow cars to pass under. You change elevation with uphill and downhill sections that have a predefined height of 12 grid dots. So you will need to raise and lower over and underpasses in increments of 12 grid dots. This example has a bridge piece 24 grid dots above the starter grid, but you can technically fit cars under a bridge only 12 grid dots above. If you want to run a regular track piece over another regular track piece, you need to add another 12. The dilemma we are now facing is that the bridge piece has been elevated 24 grid dots above our current track surface, which means we need two uphill sections to get our cars up to the bridge piece. Each uphill and downhill section is as long as a long straight, so you will need to plan for ways to fit those sections into your layout. Here I'm adding a hairpin left to move the track away from the bridge temporarily to allow room for the uphill sections. Here I'm copying an uphill section I already put down after the start line, and I'll add that after the hairpin left to get us the second elevation change needed. I jumped ahead slightly in the process to a problem you might encounter while building tracks and that is misaligned track pieces. There are many options available including more specialized short straight track pieces but many times getting it close enough is fine given the slight wiggle room allowed on the receiver zones in the track piece logic. So here, even though this portion will cause some overlap on the other end of this curve, it is slight enough that it should fall within the allowed tolerance. Even if it does not, you can adjust the zones later and we will come back to that. One thing to keep in mind is that for every uphill track piece, you will need a downhill track piece and vice versa so your track ends up at the elevation of the starter grid piece. In just a moment, I'm going to make a, a mistake in construction so see if you can spot it. We'll come back to this later to briefly discuss troubleshooting. Another misalignment case just to show you some options you might work with to come up with a solution. 
This time I'm going with the short track piece solution to bridge the gap. First solution I went with was a large right 90 curve and overlap, but you can see that results in an unappealing visual transition and might also cause some issues with logic alignment. Filling in with specialty pieces is a totally viable solution, but be aware that the greater variety of track pieces you employ, the greater the graphics thermal cost, and the less room you will have to bring extra scenery into the scene. Ultimately, this section still has overlap, but it doesn't detract visually, and it actually ends up within the tolerance of the track piece logic receiver zones. So usually as long as you're not obviously trying to push it, you should be fine on these alignment adjustments. A word on the straight track pieces, each smaller version is half again as big as the next larger one, so you're unlikely to plug a hole like this right away and may need several different smaller pieces to do so successfully. After completing the circuit, I am test driving and whoopsie, we run into a problem where we are getting a wrong way signal when we shouldn't. This is a sign that the receiver zones between two track pieces are not connecting. So is the problem where you thought it was? Turns out this was an uphill section turned the wrong way rather than a downhill. We delete that and then replace it with the proper downhill section. Also recall we cloned that errant uphill section and reused it on another part of the track that will need to be corrected as well. Circuit is complete. Let's talk about thermo briefly. For gameplay, the logic in the track pieces costs heavily in the wires and animation subthermo. This will restrict you to about 110 pieces and nearly surely keep your lap times under two minutes. If you run up against the thing limit, I recommend ungrouping all the track pieces. You will free up one half of a thing per removed group and you will also notice that you can remove some parts of given track pieces to free up even more things. This also exposes the lap distance microchips on the track pieces to make adjusting the wireless receiver zones easier without x-ray vision. When scrounging for gameplay thermo, keep in mind the track pieces are made up of several sculpts and some of these are not totally necessary like the guardrails. This is because those items do not keep the cars on the track. This is accomplished with invisible bumper sculpts. You will see them if you turn preview invisibility off. It is important to understand that these bumpers are not perfectly situated for all scenarios and may block the roadway in places causing bizarre collisions during gameplay with apparently nothing. Problem areas will need to be trimmed to function properly. Here is a part in the roadway. We will scope into that sculpt and select the stretch tool to adjust this edit. This will create a unique sculpt which will cost extra in terms of graphics thermo, but these are loose and relatively cheap so it's not a huge worry. Generally the stretch tool, a large negative cylinder, or a long negative rectangular box will be able to solve any problem you encounter with these bumpers. However, given the situation, one solution will work better than the others. First thing I'm trying here is stretch on the cylindrical part, but this alters the inner part of the curve, which we don't really want. A better solution is to cut the offending portion out with a long negative rectangular box. This retains the proper collision shape of the inside part of the curve. Now's a good time to return to the topic of the mini-map. Your objective with that is to match the layout of your track in miniature. The sculpts used in the mini-map are the same as the road surface sculpts within the track pieces that make up your full-scale track. They're just scaled way down here. You can also choose to not have a mini-map by simply deleting it and the microchip surface snap to it. Make sure you do not delete the camera if you choose to do this, as they are scoped together one level up. When manipulating the minimap, make sure you have time reset by clicking L3. This will ensure the minimap is lined up 
with the grid. I find it best to use a 1 32nd grid for this and fine adjusting with precise move. The default test track layout has a lot of pieces you can reuse. I usually move those pieces out of the way rather than deleting so I have them handy later if needed. Proceed with mirroring your full size track. This process is somewhat long and tedious. It helps to periodically check your accuracy by playing the game and seeing if the dots line up properly. We're almost off the track right off the bat, but I won't be too picky, otherwise you'll spend forever tweaking this. Then the dots leave the track completely because the curve I used was too large. No problem, let's go back and put the correct section in its place. You may be tempted to run a piece of track and then Adjust the mini-map from there. This would be easier, but the map will get off-grid due to it being scoped in with the camera. The mini-map will quickly become wonky as you struggle to get the pieces flat and near the same elevation. Better to reset time, work on the grid, and slog through it from the starter grid. If your mini-map is getting in the way of your other HUD elements or you simply want it elsewhere on screen, you can move it by scoping in until you see the mini-map microchip and then moving the whole thing. Make sure you are not moving the camera when you do this. Let's say you've added all your scenery and now it's time to post your playable racing scene for others to enjoy. There is one more step to activate the scoreboard so your players can compete with each other for fastest lap. After publishing your scene you must place it into a dream and then publish that. The Super GP kit race logic does the rest. Super GP also lets you combine multiple tracks into a whole racing game with menu, but I haven't gotten to that yet. This video is to get you publishing your first scene and having fun making playable content in as simple a way as possible, like I have. If you publish any Super GP tracks in Dreams, let me know and I'll post them up on Twitter and put them into a collection to maybe get you a few more plays. My next video will probably be next year's top 10 Dreamscom booths, but that's all for now. Until next time, I'll see you in the Dreamiverse.